So we are in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. We've left chapter 2, which discusses the false teachers that were present in the first century, uh, those that were uh, given salvation and then perverted the gospel and changed it to another gospel, which would lead them back into sin. So uh, the motivation for them to realize how serious this is, is chapter 3 talks about the day of the Lord, which is a kind of euphemistic term, right? We're meaning more than just a day that God made, but the day that he, uh, that, that Jesus returns from heaven for judgment. Uh, and we'll see what is involved in that according to Peter's vision here. So Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved, and both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So we'll pause there. So he's saying this is the second letter or epistle that he has written. Uh, that's, you know, of course, we have First Peter, and now we have Second Peter, so that would make sense. There are a couple of times, especially with Paul, talking about what letter he is uh, writing or that he has read, where the facts don't line up. And there are some letters that we apparently do not have preserved that are apparently not necessary for us to have. Um, but this one is letter two. Now, verse two, the predictions of the holy prophets. So not only are we talking here in the scope of the prophets from the Old Testament, right? But also the prophets that were present in the first century. Uh, in the book of Acts, for example, in the book of Luke, chapter one, we have prophets that are there, uh, the prophetess Anna right there in the temple when Jesus was born and going to be uh, kind of sanctified. Um, so we have prophets of the Old and New Testament as well, just kind of be aware of that. And the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So the ones that were sent by this congregation, they apparently had the gifts as well, and God spoke through them. Verse 3, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, that would make sense if they're scoffers that they would scoff, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Because ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, I have thought about this passage a lot this year. Uh, 2020 has been a, a wild ride for a lot of different reasons. Now, uh, this is a verse that's popped into my mind often because it's one of those verses that is like, well, you know, everything's just kind of keeping going. Everything is cyclical. Everything is, you know, the same as it always was. So why should I be concerned or motivated to, to live in a different way? Um, this is the year for this passage. I mean, this is the year where things have not been continuing as they always have since creation. Um, you know, our lives have changed so significantly just based on the virus and the protests and the election. I mean, who knows what else is going to happen before the end of the year. Um, but anyway, this is kind of, the, this verse shows us that they were in a lull. They were, you know, in a comfortable rhythm. And Peter is trying to shake them out of that comfort and say, listen, there's a day coming where if you're not prepared uh, you're not going to appreciate that day. Verse 5, For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Now, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, you'll see that, in fact, God did shape this world out of water, right? So we kind of see the spirit or the breath or the wind hovering over the face of the deep, of the deep waters is the idea of how our world was formed. And that by means of, of these, the world that then existed, so before the flood, was deluged with water and perished. So what Peter's doing here is they're saying, well, we don't really have a motivation because, you know, everything's just going to continue like it always has. And Peter says, no, did you forget the fact that there was an entire existence before the flood that was killed by the flood, by water? So the world has already been reformed once before. It's going to be reformed again, if you will. So verse 7, but by the same word, 
the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So we pause here and say, uh, well, what does that mean? Well, if you remember, they had the firmament, right? This water vapor that covered uh, the earth before the flood. And then we have um, the deep coming up through the earth. So you had water from above and water from below. And that completely washed all of creation out of existence, uh, except for Noah, those eight souls, and then the animals that were on board the ark. So just like the world was ready and prepared to be destroyed by water before Noah, right now apparently we are, our earth is conditioned to be destroyed and reformed by fire. Now how's that going to happen? Well, I have no idea. Um, it could be anything, right? Uh, I heard a hypothesis that, you know, we were able to achieve a nuclear explosion by harnessing an atom and we were able to split the nucleus, just doing that with one atom, and we have a nuclear bomb. Uh, everything we know is made out of atoms, so if the Lord so desired, he could just split all the atoms and this world's gone. Um, that was one theory, of course. We're never going to know, I mean, until it happens, and even then we probably won't even care. Uh, it could be solar, right? could be just volcanoes, could be a meteor, we, we don't know. The whole point is, Peter is saying, the first world was destroyed by water, now we're, gonna, we're waiting for the day where this earth is going to be transformed by fire. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, this is not code. This is a metaphor, right? He's saying here that when you look at God, you can't look at God's perception the way that we look at time because God is outside of time. God never ages. There is, he's outside of that realm that he made where there is a cycle to the sun rising and then the moon coming around the earth and a day and a night. That's not really how God operates. He's outside of that creation. And so what Peter is not saying here is when you see a day or a certain number of days in the book of Revelation, what you got to do is add, you know, times that by a thousand and that gives you the exact, that's, that's not what we're doing here. Peter is just simply stating the fact that when we are waiting for Christ to return, when we are waiting for this transformation of this earth by fire, uh, we can't look at it through our own time lens. God's not going to operate based on our schedule. He's going to do whatever he, he wants. Uh, and then verse 9, the Lord, this is the ESV, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Is that going to be possible where everyone repents? Uh, no. Biblically, that's not the case. Um, so the, the argument in verse 9 is Peter is addressing the, the folks that say, well, we are waiting for Christ to come back. We're waiting for the destruction of this earth and the reformation, uh, reformation of it. We're looking for the new heaven, the new earth. Um, what's God waiting for? He's not just slow or slack concerning his promise. He's waiting for the opportune time. He's waiting for the time that is right. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So you don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to be sudden. And when the heavens will pass away with a roar, so the heavens here talking about space, the sky, the things above us, and the elements or heavenly bodies. Now, this is a debated issue. The Greek word here is not very clear. Um, either we're talking about the elements, meaning the things that we see when we look up at the stars and we see the constellations. That's, that's one idea. Uh, when we say the word elements, we think about the periodic table, right? That's not what Peter had in mind here. He didn't know that there was such a thing as called a periodic table. So we're not talking about, you know, lead and oxygen and nitrogen, all that being destroyed per se. We're talking about the idea of the things that have always been there. They're not going to be there anymore. They will be burnt up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So it's going to be manifest, right? It's kind of like when you see a forest fire. 
right? You look out into the woods and you kind of see thicket and you see leaves and you see twigs and sticks and the trees that are poking up there. And then when a forest fire goes through there, all you see is just the ashes on the ground and then the exposed wood from the trees. It's kind of like there's no covering anymore is the idea. And then here's this kicker, verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, meaning that if we know that there's not going to be a hiding place for sin anymore, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? So we'll pause there. So he's saying, if we know that's what the world's going to be like, everything is going to be exposed, meaning all our secrets, all our sins are going to be out there for everyone to view, including the judge. How should we live? Well, he says that we should live uh, in holiness, so like God, godliness, like God, waiting for, so being patient for the coming of the Lord, and then even this, hastening. So it's kind of like, um, you know, have you prayed that God would come back? It's a consideration, right? If we're really looking forward to that day, we should be, you know, praying, come, Lord Jesus, like, come take us home. Um, I'm sure you probably had that thought before, but there's only been a couple of moments in my life where, um, you know, I've been able to actually say, I'm ready to go now. Like, I'm, I'm ready to, to go home. Um, so anyway, it's a thought. So part B of 12, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. So, um, interesting. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And if you want to see more about that, Revelation 22, uh, for a cross-reference. Okay, verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot, spot or blemish, and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. Well, I'm glad that Peter found some of Paul's writings to be difficult. Uh, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. By the way, uh, this is Peter saying that what Paul wrote is considered scripture. In case you ever had any doubt that what Paul wrote was considered canon or a part of the Bible, if you will, from Peter's perspective, Peter says it's scripture. So that helped me a lot when I was um, a new convert. So, Verse 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you not be carried away with the errors of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. The day of eternity, or the last day, right? Amen. So that's Second Peter for you. Um, you kind of get a picture of what the church looked like in the first century, towards the end of the first century, AD 68, right, uh, or so. And you see what the problems were, and you kind of see what the, the end times look like from Peter's perspective. So that's going to conclude Second Peter for us. Uh, we'll pick up next week, Lord willing, and cover the book of Jude. Jude is, again, like Second Peter. He quotes the book of uh, First Enoch. I encouraged you last week to, if you're at all interested in this kind of stuff, read that book. It's not that hard. Uh, there are some wild stuff in it. It's fun to read. Uh, no, it's not inspired. Uh, definitely not. But uh, it's, it's interesting that Peter and Jude both quote it in their books because that means that they were familiar with that book. Um, it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well, so it's before the time of Christ. And uh, it's interesting. So... Anyway, we'll talk about Jude next week. Thank you for your attention.